recording is. There we go. Uh, so now I'll move ahead this slide. Uh, for those of you that are familiar with using Blackboard, can you give me a check mark? And if you're not sure where the check mark is, right under your name in the participant window, there are four icons on the furthest right. When you hover over that or click on it, you'll have an option for a green check or a red X. Great. Okay, so several of you are Red X. That's fantastic, Ingrid. Thank you if you're not familiar with it. All right, so we've got a mix, and, uh, and that's always a nice blend to have. So what I'm going to do here, this uh, slide here, is just a screenshot of the interface that you're using right now, and it should look fairly similar for you. I'm going to use my pointer here to point out a few of the features. Up here we've got the audio video box, and if you are seeing a big black box right now, you can just click that little black down arrow, and that will minimize uh, the video area. We don't generally use the video during these sessions, as it does tend to slow down our uh, transmission of our content. To use your microphone, you've got your talk button, and we just remind you to turn it off again when you have finished speaking. And below that, we've got our participant window, which right now, uh, the screenshot only had me in the room at the time, but you can see we've got a number of people who joined us today. And these four icons here are uh, uh, the first one, anyway, the smiley face, is uh, our primary feedback. And if you hover your mouse over that, you'll see that uh, there's some smiley face options, applause, or a confused symbol. If you want to go ahead and try one of those and maybe give us a thumbs up if you're understanding everything so far. Fantastic. Wow. It's the group that listens, Nelly. <laughs> um, now, next to that, we have another little symbol, and that is just if you need to step away from your computer for any reason, because we know it's uh, evening, I assume for most of you, uh, and that you've got families and dogs and whatnot hanging around. So if you need to step away, you can click on that, and it'll just let us know that you're not there, so we won't call on you. The next symbol is the raising hand symbol, and what we're going to do is we're only going to have one mic enabled tonight, and that's just to prevent overlap and, and feedback. So when you do want to ask a question, which you're free to do throughout the session, you're going to go ahead and click that hands up button, and you can try it right now. And you'll see that uh, we hear a bing, and then the order that you raised your hand is the order that uh, Mally can call on you to respond. And when you're finished, I think you can put your hand down just by clicking the hand button again. Now you've already gotten a quick look at the check mark button. And that may be something that Mally uses as well if she wants to just uh, do a quick poll and ask you how you're doing. Then down here, of course, we have the, the chat box. And you'll probably see a lot of activity in there as well. Uh, and so you can enter comments. You can also send a direct comment to uh, myself or Mally as the moderators if you don't want to share it with the public room. Uh, one of the things that you might find useful is that these three boxes, the chat, the participants, and the audio box, can all be unpinned and moved around just like other windows that you'd be accustomed to um, having on your, on your desktop. So you can stretch the participants list if you would like to, or stretch the chat box if you'd like to, so that you can see more of it at once. Then over here, we have the primary um, whiteboard screen. And uh, today, we're probably not likely to be using a whole lot of that. We're going to have a lot of more uh, video and, and web tour activity happening. And so um, we're probably not going to need to use those tools tonight. But if you do have any questions throughout the session or if something pops up, then, uh, then by all means, we'll take care of that then. Uh, right now, though, I am going to teach you one tool. So down here at the very bottom, where I've plopped the blue arrow again, is a, uh, it's like a clip art tab. And if you click on that, and then the second tab is common symbols, you'll see a whole bunch of arrows, check marks, exclamation points, happy faces, and whatnot. And what I'm going to do is ask you to select one of those, and you just need to click on it. And then I am going to move ahead to our next slide, which is a map of Ontario. And you can drop your symbol wherever you can uh, get it close enough to show us where you are located right now in Ontario. Fantastic. As usual, we do seem to be clustered in uh, central and southern Ontario. Oh, we got someone up there in Thunder Bay. 
Well, welcome. I'm so glad you could join us. Wonderful. All right, then. I am going to turn it over to Mally now. So welcome, Mally, and thank you very much. And, uh, and I hope everyone enjoys the session. Thanks, Louise. Um, for, first of all, I just need to check with Louise. Did you get the PowerPoint? Let me pop back over to my email over here and, and check. Um, it doesn't appear that I did. What email address did you send it to? Um, I put it in the chat box in the moderator. It's a uh, um, and, and the, um, it's in the cloud. <laughs> it was too big to send, so I sent it to the cloud. So I think what I'm going to do just is just share my, um, my desktop because it's just in one of those days. It's just, yeah. So, oh, you've got it. So why don't you try and load it and then I'll get caught up. But, um, just to get everybody sort of familiar, um, my name is Mally Bickley and I te I'm a teacher in Simcoe District School Board just north of, um, just north of Toronto. Um, I teach in Bradford and I teach a really active, um, fun bunch of grade fives. And um, it's, it's great and normally we, I do these presentations with um, my friend and, and, part, and uh, partner in crime, Jim Carlton, but apparently he's not well. Um, I heard from him this afternoon around 12 and it just said that he wasn't well at all. And that was it, just one little text. So I don't think he's coming. So we've got had a little bit of a glitch and then in through all of that, we lost our internet at school. And so some of the activities that I wanted to do with you, I couldn't even get ready because I had no internet to do it. And when I finally got to those pages, a couple of the pages, um, it's, anyway, just really was one of those days. So please bear with me. I'm just going to share my screen. And Louise said for me to turn on mic up, so I'm going to try that too. I hope that's a little bit better. Um, just, if you can hear me okay, if you could just put a, a check mark and, and then I'll get everything set from here. Okay. So let me just share my screen, and I'm really, really sorry that I'm normally much more organized than this, but this is one of those days. So I'm going to share my desktop. So. I'm hoping that this, no, I can't see anything else except for what's going on. So Louise, if you can kind of give me a, um, a signal of some sort, because I can only see one thing or the other, Yes, hi, and the PowerPoint is coming. Hi. Yes, do you what? want to switch back to the whiteboard and see if it showed up? And uh, we're going to all keep our fingers crossed that everything's all good in there. Okay. I don't see it yet. So you know what we're going to do, guys? I'm going to put up a new whiteboard. And the first activity that we were, I was going to do with you is just something fun. Um, and one way that when we do sessions like this, because you'll see in a little while, this is one way that I do, we do select, connect our students with kids all over the world. And a getting to know you activity is just having the kids write um, on, actually, 
a lot of the times they write on the smart board or they just use their computers to send a little bit of a message. So I'm going to put up a new whiteboard. And my question was, just write something in there, just say hello to each other. Oh, there it goes. Yay. <laughs> they're coming. Sorry, the guys I, I are coming. Respond. While the PowerPoint was loading, I'm not able to type in the chat or speak on <laughs> Sorry. Hey, great. Okay, so something that made you laugh today. Just put um, something that made you laugh today. So if you go over to the side, there are some tools um, right underneath that smiley face where you loaded the um, loaded the where you were in Ontario. There's a little pen, or there's also a place that you can. Um, enter some text on the screen. So just press those buttons and then you can type or you can do anything. So actually, I'm just going to get out of that. And this is something that I would have my students do when they're talking to other students. Here we go. Oh, that's cool, the one with the age of 100. I, oh, that is so cool. I'm going to suggest that to our um, primary teachers. That's great. So the aging app, I'm going to write that down. Oh, I see. Here we go. For some reason, I don't see. Oh, sorry. I'll go back to that. Sally, if you want to take your slide, you can your slide with your up in the upper right corner of the whiteboard. Sounds like people had a good time at school today, which is great. Um, I'm I'm definitely going to try that aging app. I'm going to can the person who did that type is it a um, an iPhone app or an iPad app? <clears throat> because I think a couple of us might be interested in doing that iPhone. I think okay, awesome. I'm going to get my kids to do that. I think they'd really enjoy that because our hundred today for some reason is next Tuesday. Um, okay, so. Uh, now that I might be back in the groove here, um, this is Jim Carlton and Mally Bickley, but you're going to be hearing my voice exclusively, and I, I'm sorry about that because Jim does an awesome presentation and he has so much to add to this. So um, 
we're going to be talking about how we connect our students globally with kids um, all around the world. And I think to sort of talk about our journey is to go back about seven or eight years ago. And um, both Jim and I were at the stage in our careers where we, we still liked teaching, we liked going into school, we thought we were doing a good job, but it was almost becoming repetitive. And um, we just weren't sure if we really, really wanted to keep going with teaching. And um, really not sure if, if it was a career that we really thought that we could last until that magic 85 number. Um, we didn't really know a whole lot about technology, um, and these are Jim's slides, so I'm going to tell a little bit of his story, but he um, and I both looked at, we were, looked at um, technology as we thought it was sort of dehumanizing, that um, it was a lot of, we, we felt it really put people in isolation, that we weren't, um, we just didn't see the, the need for using technology in the classroom and didn't see how it could apply to um, working with others and, it, you know, we thought it could be dehumanizing and in, in using it in, in different, just in, it can be dehumanizing, but we really didn't see the purpose of integrating it into our classroom program. And to be quite honest, um, I know that I was a little bit hesitant about using technology because I didn't know how it worked. I was scared of not knowing how it worked. And if I didn't know how it worked, and how was I going to be able to teach the kids how it was working? And it was almost like me needing to keep control of what was going on. Um, what I was finding about seven, eight years ago, I was at the stage I was in teach, into teaching for about 20 years. And those of us that have been teaching for that long kind of um, know that, you know, if you've been there a long time and you still have another 10 or 15 years to go. and um, you know, my kids had grown up and it was at a time in education where teachers had sort of been, um, we didn't have a lot of good press. We were given these huge curriculum documents and we were told to teach all these expectations and literally check them off as we were going down the list. And, you know, I thought I was a really good teacher, but because I was teaching curriculum, um, and here's, you know, all the curriculums that we have to teach. Because I was delivering so much curriculum, I really felt that I was losing focus of, of teaching kids. And, and if I was disengaged with all this curriculum that I was teaching, I just felt really, really sorry for these, um, you know, little seven-year-olds who were so sweet. And, and I just loved being with them, but I was really losing sight of, of working with the kids because the pressures were so... Um, heavy on delivering all this curriculum, and, and this is even before the testing became, you know, so prevalent as, as it is today. So I actually took a little bit of a break. I took a six-month break. One Thursday um, afternoon, I closed my classroom door and said, I'm not coming back. No one's going to make me, and I'm not going to do this anymore. And I took a little bit of a break and really did some soul searching and thought, you know, do I really want to continue teaching? And uh, Jim, at this time, had started working with an organization called IEARN, which is the International Education Resource Network. And he was really excited about some of these projects that I'm going to be talking to you about that connected students all around the world. And, and he was talking to me about how excited he was and, and how um, it really was changing his focus of, about teaching and really made him excited. And he said, look, if you're going to, you know, don't quit, but just maybe come back and and we, we can work on some of these projects together. So the more projects that we were working on together um, and collaborating together and seeing the kids collaborate, sort of the more joy and, um, and more interest it brought to our teaching because we were working, working together along with other staff members, um, really talking about issues that made a difference to, to kids and learning about different cultures and it was it was really quite invigorating. So came back to teaching and haven't turned back since. Um, so what we're what we're I am gonna keep saying we um, because I know he's with us in spirit. <laughs> um, what we're going to talk about is information communication technologies, but really 
and integrating them or embedding them into classroom practice. But what we're really going to be talking is the C part of it, the communication, what these technologies allow us to do for collaboration, where kids are able to contribute on a meaningful level, that there's um, real creativity happening, uh, that, that students are cooperating not only w with themselves, but also cooperating um, and collaborating with others around the world, that there's a real sense of building community, not only for the community of the school and the classroom, but also community as part of being a global citizen. There's learning together, which is a huge part of these projects, and also change, change for the students. Um, I know that these projects have changed who I am as a person, and they've also changed who I am as a teacher. And it's also changed the way I taught. And if we look at, at learning, and as, as teachers, we should be, um, you know, having some introspection, you know, introspective learning and um, really you know, change is good, and, and this definitely changed the way that I was teaching and also learning. Um, so when we talk about the new literacies, I just, you know, we hear these words, Web 2.0 tools, all the time, and that means sort of anything that's out on the Internet that helps you, you and your students communicate with other people. Um, you know, five, six years ago, um, it was really difficult to be publishing online, but now with so many open source and free tools, it's really easy for students and teachers to be having their own blogs, to be sh to collaborating on wikis, to be sharing information on podcasting, using video sharing like uh, YouTube and TeacherTube and Vimeo, which we'll be using tonight, social networking like Facebook and MySpace. But one of our favorites is called Taking It Global, web and video conferencing, which is exactly what we're doing tonight, and microblogging, which is Twitter. So I just want to see by a check mark or a smiley face if you have used any of these tools with your students. That's awesome. And I think the beauty of them is that they've become so accessible now. Not only do kids have um, computers and laptops, or desktops in their classrooms, but they're also they also have that power in their pockets. They have um, iPods and iPads and smartphones and um, all sorts of devices in their pockets that they're that they're using, and it's almost be kind of like a little mini revolution in education where these kids are out there using these tools and they're out there communicating with each other, they're posting videos on the internet, um, they're talking on blogs, they've got their own Facebook pages whether they're old enough or not. Um, and we kind of liken it to like Lord of the E flies where kids are out there with without with not a lot of rules. They there's, there aren't any rules really um, in using these tools and they need um, responsible adults and people that they look up to to show them how to use these tools responsibly, respectfully, and in a meaningful way so that, that we don't run into situations where students are um, posting inappropriate things on Facebook that's going to affect them for the rest of their lives. So we really need to be, it's our responsibility to be showing and not to, sh to model for them what appropriate digital citizenship looks like and encourage them to have their own digital, positive digital footprint. So the things that we're going to show you tonight are some projects that really help these students um, learn collaborative, collaboratively with others. We call it global collaborative learning, but it can global can be just opening up the walls of their classroom, um, almost having like a classroom without borders, and it can be collaborating with the class right across the hall. It can be talking to your local um, humane society. It can be working with the um, with another class in your school board, or it can be working with. 10 or 12 classes from around the world. So what these do is these projects, and you'll see there's a real theme with them. Um, a lot of them have um, help with critical thinking skills where the students are posed with problems that they're 
they need to solve problems as they're going through, so it really helps with critical thinking skills. The tasks are really meaningful. Um, it prepares students to um, be able to talk to people from all over the world um, and really learn what, it's, what it means to work, you know, side by side a student perhaps who is in China because the reality is in 10 or 12 years, they will be working side by side um, a person in another part of the world in, in business. You know, businesses um, right now, if they're asked, they know, we know that businesses want people that can solve problems together, do a collaborative problem solving, solving and also be working with people um, in a variety of different countries and, uh, you know, with a variety of different backgrounds. Um, these encourage kids to use 2.0 tools in a responsible and respectful manner. And it's all, but our focus is going back to those C's. It's working as a community. It's working on um, communication, collaboration. So it's developing the relationships. And we often say that these, we, we don't worry about the hardware. We worry about what's called what we call the hardware and how these tools foster relationships um, around the world. So most of the projects that we're going to show you are from an organization called IRON, as I said. It's um, the International Education Resource Network, and it's an organization of about 125 countries with 25,000 teachers and approximately 1, 1 million students over the course of the year um, collaborating on some of these projects. Um, there are about 250 projects in the project book, and I'm going to give a link at the very end of the presentation, so, uh, a wiki site where all of this is archived, so you don't need to, to write anything down. And um, actually, these are all supposed to be hot links, but again, it was not one of those good technology days. Um, <clears throat> so these 250 projects are all heavily based in curriculum. So you can go in the project book, which is online, and you can look into, uh, into language, and you're going to find probably 100 projects that, are all, that all support the language um, curriculum. And even though these are international pro projects, what we've learned is that um, whether you're in grade five in the United States, Canada, Japan, Kenya, or Australia, grade five kids generally need, you know, that developmentally, they're at the same stage, so a lot of the curriculum expectations are, are quite similar. So um, even though these are international projects, you can sort of look at it as a global curriculum because we all know kids need to learn to read and write, and they really support these um, they support curriculum, and as you go through, as we go through some of these projects, you're going to, you know, hopefully say, oh, that's where that fits into my uh, narrative writing, or this is we can we can fit this into our grade six First Nations study, um, or you know, even a grade six student working with a grade twelve student, student we've had those situations as well. Um, you'll see how it can all sort of fit together. So. The first project that I'm going to talk about is um, one that, that's uh, called the Batshen Diaries. And, oh, has luck have, has it, uh, Jim has this link. So I'm just going to spend two seconds getting the link for, the, um, for a short video that's going to explain to you who Batshen is. And the background on this is really important to the project, and you'll see why in just a sec, but just bear with me. Um, I'm doing the best that I can do with um Okay, so I'm going to give you a link. I'm going to be putting a link in to a YouTube video. Again, I'm sorry. Nally, this is a separate YouTube video? Yeah, just hold I'm just I've got the link right here, just hold on a sec. It's one that I it's, Perfect. I I knew that this, hold on a sec. I've got the link here. So here we go. 
Um, release, would I need to press the play button or will it play automatically? If you're doing the web tour, have you dropped off? Oh, here it comes. Okay, everybody, if the video starts automatically for you, great. If it doesn't, go ahead and press the play button. And if it still doesn't, if it doesn't show up at all, I'm going to drop the link for this into your chat box. And you can click on it from there. And when you're finished and when you're watching the video, video, you can come back and give us the green check mark. Batren loved Batren Jerusalem and wrote of its beauty and holiness and her fervent desire for peace. In November 1995, Israel's Prime Minister Malin, you're going to want to turn off your mic. Gunned in in Tel Aviv. Among the hundreds of condolence letters received by his widow Leah was a poem from a 14-year-old teenager, Batren Shachak. She wrote eloquently of Rabin's achievements as a leader and condemned. So I hope you were able to learn a little bit about that Chen and, and sort of what a special girl she was. Um, after she was killed by the suicide bomber, her mother, Eilat, who you saw in the video, um, she is also an IRON member. She was before. She was an IRON teacher in Israel. And she, um, they, a few months after, oh, sorry, I didn't even pay attention. <laughs> Does everyone finish the video? Um, she found her diaries in her, her bedroom and, and noticed the, the depth in, of, of the writing and how profound it was, especially for a, a little girl who was only eight years old when she started writing these diaries. So Ayelet knew that the that writing was very powerful and very meaningful to her daughter, so she published these, the diaries um, because she wanted to reach out to other students and other children who lived in the same sort of um, situation as Bat Chen. She lived at the highlight of the Palestinian um, Israeli um, conflict. So it, right now it's published in about uh, 12, 15 different languages. And what happens in this project is um, in Ireland, we have things called learning circles, where twice a year um, a facilitator will put together eight to ten classrooms from around the world and walk teachers through um, a very structured um, and organized either a book study or um, a writing project or, or kids um, putting together a newspaper using a collaborative tool, using collaborative tools to create a, a newspaper. But the structure is, is always the same. At the beginning of the project, the first couple of weeks, the students get to know one another. Then the facilitator introduces the topic of learning. In this case, the topic of learning is the Bat Chen Diaries. We want the students to understand a little bit about Bat Chen, what a wonderful little girl she was, or young woman she was, and also how her writing helped, up, helped her get through a very, very difficult situation. Um, we encourage the students to write in the style of Bat Chen, and so once a week we post um, the, you know, we want all the, the students to be reading one of her diary entries and one of the most, the one that's my favorite is what an irritating mother. So everybody in the learning circle, the, the students from the eight to ten, excuse me, eight to ten classes from around the world all read the little diary entry about what an irritating mother Bat Chen has and then the students will, will write their diary entry. So for about eight or ten weeks. Um, we look at her different diary entries, and the students create their own personal diaries and, and write sort of in the style of Bat Chen. And what we find as we're going through this project is students from all over the world have all of those same concerns um, in common. Um, she writes about um, her struggles with her siblings. She writes about her first love. She writes about her friends, um, her anxiety about what's going on in the situation in Jerusalem. One of her journal entries is all based on why she has to sleep with a gas mask under her bed. So the other thing that happens is the kids learn about what happens to students around the world who are living in war affected areas. And unfortunately, there's millions of kids that are living in this situation. So as we're working through the project, the students are put into what we call a collaborative classroom space. The one that we use in particular for this project is, is called Taking It Global. Um, and if you go to um, Taking It, just do a, 
a, a search for Taking It Global, it will take you to this to um, to an amazing site. But we'll talk a little bit more about that this later. But what they have a feature where students can um, essentially join an online classroom. Space. Um, there's also Edmodo. We could certainly run this in Edmodo where the teacher or the facilitator will post a discussion and then the students will join in the discussion. They'll give feedback to each other. Um, they will um, do some reading reflections in here. They're very, very simple to use. And what we like about it is the kids have the freedom to talk to each other and have um, focused sort of on task. We're all talking about on task discussions, but have focused on task discussions based on um, a common um, piece of writing or a common a common big idea. The other thing we like about Taking It Global is they have um, the opportunity for students to work in, um, post their work in writing galleries, and they can also post artwork in art in online art galleries. So for students, some students um, that I've been work that I worked with in this project weren't able to. The writing was not their strength, but they were certainly able to express themselves in art. So we were able to take pictures and upload them to the art gallery. Um, and then the other students in the project were able to give feedback to each other, which was totally complete. It was awesome that they were, you know, they were giving critical reflections to each other about their writing and about their artwork as we were going along. Um, towards the end of the project, you know, the, our hope is that the kids get some really deep discussions about what it's like to live in a war affected area, what can we do to support kids that live in war affected areas, and really learn about some of the real issues that happen um, to some of these kids. But at the very end of the project, we want the students to publish an online, to create an online publication. So they go back through their writing, they do some, um, they do quite a bit of editing, they, they choose the five best pieces of their writing and we put them all together into an online um, a large PDF file. And so we've essentially created an online book of writing from kids from around the world. So in this particular instance, we had kids, two classes in Canada, uh, three or four classes in the United States, and a high school in Israel um, that contributed to this online publication. And this, this publication is put online and kids, they can share it with their parents, they share it with their peers, and they're really excited that they've created this piece of amazing work together. Um, another aspect of the project as we're going along, um, we encourage the kids to meet each other online, not just in asynchronous communication where they're posting in forums and posting their artwork in and, and writing work in collaborative classroom spaces, we really encourage them to meet each other online because we find that as soon as they see that other classrooms are out there, that there becomes a real depth and a real commitment to the project. So we try and organize two or three, um, either Illuminate, sorry, it's Blackboard now, but Illuminate or Adobe Connect or Skype sessions where the students actually meet each other. So this is, a, this is one of the very first ones where the project facilitator, in this case, was ALS best friend, her name is Rudy, and she's the iron coordinator in Israel, and she is talking to the students about that Chen and listening to some of the, their diary entries, and she really encouraged them to go along, and, and I've never seen so many boys, in, to, to be quite honest, I was at this, these kids were 10 years old, and every we, Monday was our writing day for the Bat Chen diary project and the kids, the boys were so excited to write in their journals which, you know, you don't get a lot of 10 year old boys that are really excited about writing in, in diaries but they were really into it and really excited and, and very excited to share with, um, with Rudy. A real honor for this project is the opportunity for the kids to be able to, um, to talk to Ayelet. And um, I'm just going to show you a really quick video about where my students are, um, they have the, the chance to speak to Ayelet, who is Bat Chen's mom, and, um, and talk to her about, just copy and paste this, or maybe um, Louise, if you could do that, it's on the page, it's actually above, the Vimeo link is just above, where it says Bat Chen's mom, can you possibly do that? 
and put it in the web tour. So you're going to see the kids talking to um, to ALS, and they were really, really nervous about this, about talking to Bat Chen's mom because they didn't know how to react to somebody who had lost a daughter. Um, but I think you'll see that the little girl is quite compassionate, and her her Bat Chen's mom is. Just remind everyone to give a green check if you've finished the video. So I think you can see that this learning circle is a real opportunity for students to connect with a, a meaningful topic that it's really heavily based in curriculum. It's definitely a reading, it, it fits a lot of reading and writing expectations, but it also helps the kids communicate and talk about real world issues. Um, so for us, it helps the kids, it's not using the technology, using the chat rooms or using the forums or using um, Skype or synchronous tools like we're using now, just for the sake of using the tool, it really gives a purpose to um, using the technology in a meaningful way. Um, the learning circles are, are an example of of, of um, a project that that really relies heavily on technology, but there are some of these collaborative projects who that don't rely on a lot of technology but still need a lot of expectations. The Art Miles project is one that doesn't rely on a lot of technology, but the um, the outcome is, is, is amazing. So the Art Miles project was started in 1997 by um, a lady named Joanne who, um, it's a really long story, I won't go into it now. If you want to do look at the history of the Art Miles project, you can go on their site. But she realized that art is a way for student, for kids to express how they feel. And so she put out an invitation to teachers around the world to have their students create Art murals that are five feet by by twelve five feet high and twelve feet wide, um, and these to to talk to teach others about their community, their culture, their music, their fairy tales, their folk tales, um, celebrations, um, anything special that happens in their country. And in two thousand and ten, there were five thousand two hundred of these murals that were wrapped around the pyramids in Giza. Um, at the end of the celebration of the um, United Nations Decade of Peace. Um, but when the, the project was, that was sort of to be the end of the project. And when the project was over, we all realized there were a lot of us, a lot of the teachers who, um, who wanted the, the project to continue and really let kids express themselves through art. So um, one of the teachers in Japan came up with the concept of a collaborative art miles mural. So the, the premise of this project is for two classes to be connected through iron and these two classes are to teach each other about a concept or an idea um, in their culture. So. Um, so once you're paired with, with another classroom, you introduce yourself on um, a, a forum or on a, on a blog or um, it, the, they call them bulletin board sites. The person, this particular person sets them up on bulletin board sites where the kids post pictures about each other and introduce themselves and also to start, start talking about what they're going to teach another classroom about. So the class that um, I was working with, I was a literacy coach at the time, and even though I was a literacy coach, I really believe that technology supported the, the, um, the literacy program, and I still do. Um, so we decided to teach our partner class in Japan about Canadian fairy tales. Well, you know, we don't have a whole lot of Canadian fairy tales, but we have, I think, one of the best fairy tales. So we had The Paper Bag Princess by Robert Munch. So we sent over a package of, of um, Canadian fairy tales and Canadian um, artifacts and we started to talk about our, our favorite Canadian fairy tale, The Paper Bag Princess, with this class in Japan. And in return, we received some information about Japanese fairy tales. And if you know anything about Japan, they're, um, they have a very, very rich literacy, um, folk and fairy tale background. They have amazing um, 
literature. So we decided to learn about one of their favorite fairy tales that also involves a princess called the Little Fingerling. So what happened in Japan, once they learned about our fairy tales and the kids wrote letters back and forth and they spoke um, via email and these bullet, bulletin board sites, this is before we were into blogging, um, they painted what they learned about us. So their half of the mural, they painted the paper bag princess. They wrapped it all up and they sent it over to Canada and we spent some time learning about Little, little Fingerling. So we, we painted, the kids in, in Canada, in Innisfil, Ontario, just south of Barrie, they painted what they learned about fairy tales and they painted the paper bag princess. Or sorry, they painted Little Fingerling. What happens to these murals after they're created by two classes? So we had the mural at Goodfellow Public School for a few weeks. We shipped it back to Japan. It was displayed in the classes in Japan. And then it was, um, then these murals that are created by two classrooms from around the world go to major art galleries. Most of them are in Asia, but they've been to major art galleries in, um, in Europe. And what we find is the kids know that they're, they're creating for the world. So they really, they're very engaged in the project. They do their best work and they know that these things are being shown off and, and they really do incredible work. So um, it's a project that if you're interested in it, again, we have the link at the very end of the presentation, but if you're interested in this one, the sign-ups are actually in April. What we have learned is, is classes begin and end at different times of the year. So um, because this is the facilitator of this project is from Japan, their school year starts in April. So the um, sign up for the project is in April. So if it's something that you might be interested in, it's something to keep in the back of your mind that it is an awesome project. The other great thing about this is it's heavily funded by the Japanese government. So all of the materials are paid for um, by, the, by the Japanese government. So the only thing that you're responsible for is shipping it back to Japan, which costs about $25. But the learning is incredible. But um, the outcome is great, doesn't use a whole lot of technology, but really connects the classes in a meaningful way. Um, I'm not going to, Jim usually tells a story, but um, what happened with this mural, this was created by a class in, in, in Indonesia, the founder of the Art Miles Collaborative Project. Um, her name is Atsuko, and she she really works hard to connect classes all over the world. I think there's about 500 classes that she's connected over the past couple of years. And um, well, she was at, um, here. She was here at a conference at the Iron Conference in Canada a couple of years ago. Her son was mountain climbing in um, in Japan in the in the Japanese. Himalaya or whatever they, the Japanese um, mountains, and unfortunately he he died in the mountains. He was a mount, he was a very experienced mountaineering person, and he lost his life. And sort of as a, a tribute to Atsuko and her son Masa, one of the the classes in Indonesia who had participated in the project um, created this mural. Um, as, a, as a tribute to NASA and presented it to Atsuko at one of the conferences. So it's, these, these stories really touch and, and reach people and uh, they're beautiful murals. And, and this is our favorite mural because of what it means to Atsuko and also it represents the people around the world are really thinking about her and honoring her son and it's just a beautiful mural. So I've been talking a lot. <laughs> Normally I split it, but um, so we're going to show you a video, another video now that kind of sums up um, what these um, projects mean to our students and also getting you to think about maybe how you can integrate them into your classes and, and what it would mean to your kids if you were able to connect with another class. Um, one thing I want you to look for at the beginning is the students in Burkina Faso who um, really overcome some quite big obstacles to be able to collaborate with our students in Canada. Um, one, and I know we all feel that we're very privileged in Canada to have, first of all, the schools that we do and to have teaching jobs that pay pretty well and uh, we have pretty good working conditions in comparison to some, some of the teachers that you do come in contact with in some of these projects. So um, 
we just want you to think about what you really need in your classroom in order to to um, participate in these projects. And you definitely don't need a one-to-one -one laptop. Um, when Jim and I started these projects, we had one we had one um, computer in our class, and and we just knew that it was a, a way to communicate with others. And just maybe think about. Um, you know what it means to some of these kids. So I'll ask um, Louise if she can put on the global video. There it is. And there we go. Do you want me to? Oh, she's way ahead of the game. And again, when you're finished, can you please put a check mark when you've seen it? Thanks, Louise. Uh, sorry to those that um, the video wasn't working for. Um, we'll have the links all later, and, and I think the session is also archived, but it would, if you want to go back and watch them, or you can just email us and we'll send you the video. Um, but what we uh, really like about what these projects do for the students, not just in terms of academic success or uh, using technology in a meaningful way, but it really, really speaks to us for character education. And I know no matter where we are in Ontario, character education has been a huge, um, a huge push. And, and what we see in these projects, and you'll see a couple others later, that it's not just, um, it's, you know, it's care, for example, it's caring month in our school right now. And a lot of teachers are doing posters about caring, and that's awesome because it's really forcing the students to look. Um, you know, at themselves, but caring in, in these kind of projects really turn into action words, and we see that, it's, uh, it, that it changes them as people, and when I hear a 10-year-old kid at the end of a video like that talking about caring and compassion and empathy for a student that she has met through these projects in Iraq, it really is, it just, that's why we came back to teaching is because of, of those connections that um, we, um, that we made. Okay, first, and actually, Ingrid, this is great that we're going for. Um, oh, I, I was going to put questions now. Actually, usually after the video, I again, it's not a good technology day. Um, yes, absolutely for your meet a we group. Um, good to inspire them. The singer of it's um, Five for Fighting. It's called What Kind of World Do You Want by Five for Fighting. They also sang that Superman song and the Riddle. They've got awesome songs. So if you look them up on iTunes, um, it's their Five for Fighting. So what kind of world do you want? Yep. Yeah. Now, um, this is hopefully where we hope that you can grab the mic and maybe we'll have a couple of minutes of questions and if you have any you know, logistical things that I can help you with. We'll talk about a couple of more projects and and um, after that. But does anyone have any questions? Just raise your hand. I'll clear the the um, check marks. So if you have a question, either raise your hand or put a smiley. And um, if you want to grab the mic, that's great. Ingrid, are you typing something? Yeah, definitely if you, and we, we definitely want to encourage people to join IRON. However, we're going to show, I, we, I'm going to show you a couple other projects that aren't IRON, but absolutely you get a one-year membership with IRON and all you need to do is register and then um, just say that you were in the session and, and we'll approve you. Um, 
we do charge like $50 a year per teacher, $200 per school, and that's only because we have fees to pay um, to belong, to be part and associate of IRON and also because we're a nonprofit. Um, so that's, only, that's the only reason that we have to charge some fees is because for years we were paying it out of our own pocket. <laughs> um, so yeah. So let's show you how to do that. That sounds like a cool project, um, Jose. Uh, just see. There's another question here. How do link ups with schools elsewhere get established? Okay, so um, right the very, very first, once you join iEARN, you have access to um, project forums and a teacher's forum. And the way that Jim got established first with linking up with another class is he posted, once he joined IRON Canada, he posted a message in the IRON teachers forum and asked for, um, if he could connect with a developing classroom. Haven't looked back since then because once you join this community of teachers, um, you are able to um, communicate with them and they invite you to, to participate in their projects. There's a monthly, or actually every three weeks, there's a newsletter that comes from IRON, the International IRON. And um, they, they'll invite you into projects. So once you're in there, it's like a, a big community of learners and a community of teachers. And they, someone will show you and a project facilitator will help you get involved in a project. So Matthew, do you want to grab the mic? Did you have a question? or? Do you want to grab a mic? Do you want to grab a mic? Yeah, I'll grab the mic. Uh, I was wondering if you had any, if you've seen this used in high school. I've just seen a lot of examples more elementary based, uh, which are great. And I was wondering if you've seen any, like I teach a grade 12 world issues course, and I can obviously see how this would work. I was wondering if you had any examples of that. Um, we do. I, it's not that it's handy. The reason that they're all elementary, <laughs> Projects is because we're in elementary land, but that's definitely a question that we get all the time. Um, the Bat Chen project is one that goes um, right now. In that project, we have elementary and like my elementary class, and a grade 12 class in Russia that are participating. And because of the language, um, the kids in Russia communicate are communicating in English. It works well. Um, if you go through the project book. Uh, there are lots of, um, there's a project called World Hunger, Eradicating World Hunger. There's a malaria project that would really fit well in with the World Issues Project. There's uh, water quality, how to um, improve water quality in different countries around the world. There's um, environmental projects that are um, connecting high school class, secondary classes around the world. Um, there's a huge, if, if you contact the, the country coordinator in Pakistan, they have probably 50 projects on the go all the time. And that's, that's their English language um, project for, that's their English language curriculum for a lot of their schools. So there's guaranteed secondary um, projects in there. But again, it's getting into those forum spaces and asking a teacher or looking around for projects. We do, you know, unfortunately I didn't put the, that specific example of we do have a project called Machinto looking at how um, children are affected by war all over the world. And some of our best participants were grade 12 world issues and they, what they did is they created storybooks to teach little kids about world issues, um, about um, kids that are affected by war. So they wrote storybooks about the genocide in Rwanda and the, um, the um, challenges in Ecuador and in Colombia. So it just depends on how, um, you know, what slant the project wants to take. Um, Global t tagging my world is amazing. Um, that's the word I was looking for. 
today. I was telling somebody about the project. It's um, Tagging My World is a project where kids um, look at street art and um, graffiti in their area and create a, a Google map um, and put images of the street art and discuss the street art and and put it on a Google map and share it that way. That's amazing. Another one is, is um, the Global Teenager Project that somebody mentioned where you are, and, and that's a project that you need to go through learning circles for, and it's a project where you're paired with another class. It's only one or two classes that are involved in that, but the students pose a question that they're interested in. Um, a lot of times they have to do with health issues. So a class, for example, in Canada will, put, will pose a question about um, AIDS or, um, just, let's just say AIDS, and um, they'll be paired with a class, say, in Kenya, and they will be posing questions about AIDS, and then they will talk, then there will be discussions surrounding those issues, and the kids will, are collaborating on Wikispaces. Um, so there's, again, there's, there's a lot there, but unfortunately, Matthew, the reason that ours are elementary is because we're elementary teachers. But we have facilitated with high school <coughs> as well, sorry. So Christine, did you want to grab the I'm sorry, Mally, were you talking to me? My seven-year-old was talking in my other ear. <laughs> Yeah, was it, I was just asking Christine if she wanted to grab the mic. Are, are all these projects through IRON? These particular ones are, but in, I'm actually going to flip through, since I know that you guys are a lot of secondary, I'm going to flip through and go to one called Deforest Action, which is through Taking It Global that I think you might be really interested in. Um, and that's not through IRON. Taking It Global is one of our partners, but um, it's an it's environmental project through another organization. There are lots of organizations out there right now. There's um, ePals. There's a great project. Right, if anyone's teaching English at all, there's an amazing project called Rock Our World. Um, and if you just do a search that's called Rock Our World Collaboration, it'll take you to the project. And right now, um, this organization is, is forming a project where kids are we're doing a poetry slam. So kids are going to be writing poetry and creating soundtracks in GarageBand and sharing this, their, um, their poetry together and also writing music tracks together. And then we're going to be putting it all, all together into an online um, music poetry book. So that might be a really interesting one for secondary students um, because if they have iPhones, they can create their music track on their phone and write their poetry and put it all together and then share it and it's going to be amazing. So that's called Rock Our World. And I'll just put it in here. That's one to look up for sure. Um, so I'm actually going to flip through the teddy bear. Um, basically it's a teddy bear that's shared between classes, but since a lot of us are or secondary, we'll just go through that really quickly. Holiday card exchange. Um, again, quite elementary, but high school classes do participate where kids create um, Christmas cards and change them with um, 8 to 10 classes from around the world. Um, really effective, great, um, great for discussion about celebrations. Um, one way the kids do share some of their work is using Google Maps. So one of my kids, we had participated in a project and they were wondering how we were going to share so much information because some classes had done videos and some classes had done blogs and some classes had done photo albums. And what we realized, as Peter did as well when he was doing Tagging My World, is that you can um, embed an image in a Google Map and all you do is click on that map um, click on that an icon on the map and it will take you to a photo gallery or it will take you to um, a blog page and, and it, it becomes a very interactive um, activity and one of my 10 year olds figured this out so it was pretty awesome. Um, so great for critical thinking like how are we going to share our, our, um, our learning with the world. Deforest Action. Um, this is an incredible project. Um, what happens, the background on this is Taking It Global has partners, has partnered with the Smithsonian Institute and with um, Microsoft and with Staples. 
and um, the Smithsonian Institute wants to wanted to study um, the effects of deforestation um, on the orangutans in Borneo, and so they hired a, a, a movie director to create a 3D movie um, about deforestation in Borneo, but not just studying deforestation in Borneo, but also the effect of deforestation in, oh, thanks, you've got the link there, that's awesome, Louise. Um, also de studying deforestation, oh, I'll go back to the teddy bear, okay, I'll go back to teddy bear. Um, yes, it's an iron project, and it's a great one, but anyway, I'm not going to read the chat for a second. Um, so also studying deforestation all over the world. So what happens in this project is, um, Taking It Global has set up a collaborative classroom space where students all over the world um, will go in and do some research about deforestation in Borneo. They will also research about deforestation in Canada, and I did not realize um, what we didn't realize when we participated in this project is that there's a huge deforestation problem in Canada over in the, in the um, Boreal Rainforest in British Columbia. I just had no idea. So not just learning about deforestation in a country far, far away, it's also a big problem in Canada. So what happens as well in this project when the kids are, are in, in the space talking about what they've learned about deforestation in um, other faraway places and in Canada, we also have the opportunity to connect with um, with the scientists who are on the field in Borneo and also talking to the director who is creating this amazing 3D war movie and it's called Echo Warriors. So what happened in this, this director was looking for 20 high school students to go and work with her in Borneo this summer. So through Taking It Global, they put out a call to action and they said to these high school kids, now what can you do to help us stop deforestation all over the world? So these kids were creating videos and they were making um, advertisements for themselves, trying to sell themselves so that they can go and be part of this project. So they sent 20 kids from Ontario down to Borneo to work with this director and create a bit, and they're, they're working on this feature film about deforestation in, in Borneo and how they're saving the habitats of the orangutans. And what we didn't realize is there's less than 400 orangutans left in, in Borneo. It's, it, it, so it puts them on the, like they're almost extinct because they're so endangered. Um, so what the kids can do through this project is learn about how we can save the rainforest, what kind of products we don't buy when we're, um, when we're shopping. So you're, we're also teaching them about uh, social responsibility and fair trade and um, looking at um, issues, for example, about palm oil. Um, looking at the ingredients, where do the ingredients come from some of, from some of our products. And palm oil is a huge, um, a huge part of, you know, companies that purchase palm oil are causing a huge problem with cutting down trees in rainforests. So the kids learn all about that. And then, for example, what my kids did is they said, okay, we're not going to buy any chocolate if it has palm oil in it. And kind of a funny story is we participated in a, in a, a, a web conference with the scientist who was on the field in, in Borneo and he was explaining to the kids about palm oil and, and where it's sold and, and what it's some of the alternative products that you can buy. And if we were buying any chocolate that we should be looking for, for example, Cadbury doesn't have a lot of palm oil in their, in their chocolate, so they, um, and they're also fair trade. So that very same day after we came out of the video conference and the kids were all fired up and they said, oh, we're not going to buy anything that has palm oil in it and everything, the, the parent council comes into our classroom with, you know, your yearly stash of the, the chocolate that you need to sell to support the school. And without me even saying anything to the kids, they went up to the parents and said, we're not selling that chocolate if it, does, if it has palm oil on it. So the parents didn't know what to do. They were like, oh my gosh, you know, what has happened? These kids aren't going to sell the chocolate. And you know, every kid has to sell a box of the stuff, right? So they go down to the principal and they, they said, you know, Mrs. Bickley said they can't sell the chocolate. So I got into a little bit of trouble. But what was I going to say? I can't go and, and lead them to learn about 
a, pro a global problem. They want to be part of the global solution. And um, so anyway, we stood up for ourselves and the, the parents um, gave them something else to sell, but the kids were really adamant. They said, you know what, we are not selling this chocolate. It's hurting the rainforest and it's essentially hurting the world. And there we go. So if you go into deforest action, um, there's so much that happens in there. There's um, art contests, there's video conf contests, there's, they have three or four video conferences during the year. Um, right now we're in the process of putting together um, a national video conference um, based on the deforest action program where we want the kids to take action and we're going to be having Emily Hunter talk to the students. Um, Emily Hunter's father is um, one of the founders of Greenpeace. So, um, and she's young, she's 24 years old. So we're really trying to use the technology to get the kids, um, the kids taking action, solve problems, working together, and um, essentially taking a global problem and coming up with global solutions. So high school teachers, this is something definitely that your students can work towards. Um, if you're talking about world issues, this is definitely a huge world issue and it's just at right now is the beginning of um, the project. So it'll be great. Oh, who put up the rainforest thing? And uh, you know what? I was so happy to get into trouble for that. It was like, yeah, bring it on, baby. Let's see these 10-year-olds uh, stand up for themselves. And they did. They, um, they wrote the persuasive paragraphs all about how we shouldn't be buying palm oil. It was awesome. And uh, they really made a difference. It was really fun. And it's, you know, I got into trouble. And so did the kids. And they loved it. They, they thought it was great. So um, taking it global. Uh, for secondary teachers is a great place to start if you're looking for some world issues. Um, was it Matthew that was giving <laughs> positive? Yeah, well, I'm not at that school anymore, by the way. <laughs> there might be reasons for that. Um, do you want me to go back to the teddy, okay, the teddy bear project. So Matthew, take a look at Taking It Global because it's a place where your students can join. It's almost like a Facebook for social issues. So they can, <coughs> they can join Taking It Global. They become part, they, they can fit their, they can fill in their profiles and um, they'll meet students, they'll meet kids from all over the world who are interested in those same issues. And it's a huge resource in there. I, when I um, am teaching anything about any country, that's my first place to go for reliable information on a country. My, I got this little particular group of 10-year-olds. If we were doing research on any country, they didn't go to Wikipedia. They would go to the Taking a Global site because it's current information and it's accurate information. And it's, um, it, it's great. And then they were able to connect with with kids about other issues. So did you just want me to go back to the teddy bear project just really quickly? Um, so for the librarian, um, the teddy bear project is awesome. Um, what happens is two classrooms are paired through the iron forums. You meet the teacher in an iron forum and you decide to exchange a teddy bear and the teddy bear becomes an ambassador for the school or for the country. Um, and the teddy bear comes with, he comes with items from his own country. So when we received Kiki, Kiki's in blue, um, he came with a whole bunch of toys and cards and letters and a journal and flags and candy from Taiwan. And he shared those, those items with the, with the kids in the class. Maple, obviously, who's in the red sweater, um, went to Taiwan in a box and, and he took a lot of things from Canada. He took chocolate and he took fair trade chocolate, maple syrup and flags and um, pictures of Mounties and pictures of um, travel brochures that I pick up at the airport and a journal. And the kids, um, you know, a few years ago when we were doing these kind of flat Stanley projects, um, we were having to create web pages and Dreamweaver, it was very difficult, but now because of the 2.0 tools, it's very easy for us to create blogs. So Kiki and, and Maple each have their own blog. So as soon as something happens with Kiki and Maple, we put um, their pictures and we put a little story on the blog so the kids in Taiwan can see what's happening to Kiki. <coughs> and the kids in Taiwan will do the same thing for Maple. So Maple went to the, um, 
I went to, to just New Year's celebration a couple of weeks ago in, in Taiwan. So we had documents, we had documented, um, we have documentation of, of Kiki and Maple in their respective countries. So with blogging, and it makes it really in, easy to uh, communicate information back and forth with the apartment class. Um, the kids love it. We've done um, the teddy bear project anywhere from junior kindergarten up to grade eight. And because it's a, such a visual project, <laughs> the families get really into it. They take these teddy bears or these these symbols of um, these symbols of our countries all over. Um, we just had Kiki just went to Disney World and got his um, his membership to Disney Disney World. He got his you know this is my first visit button, and now he wears that proudly on his T-shirt. Um, he's been to a couple of Maple Leaf games. Um, he's been everywhere. I'm taking him to Ca uh, Cancun with me in a couple of weeks. And we'll send those pictures back to the kids in, in Taiwan, so they're going to learn about it. Um, you can start the teddy bear project in September. It's one of those ones that you can, as long as you have the teddy bear for about six months um, and can be posting on your blog regularly, it doesn't matter how long it is. Um, our, our partner class is in Taiwan, so they start school in April. So we, and then they have a long break around now. Um, so we didn't actually get him until probably October, November. It's one of those projects that you can jump in at any time um, because the school years are really flexible internationally. If you have a partner in Australia, for example, they don't start school. They're starting school on Monday. So um, if you want to jump in and get a partner in Australia, we can certainly help you do that. Um, so some of these projects take um, are short, like the holiday card exchange. It literally takes two weeks to get that one done where you're exchanging Christmas cards and learning about other cultures. This is an awesome one for grade two because you're talking about celebrations around the world. Um, and some projects like um, the Bat Chen Diaries, any of the learning circles, circles take about um, 16 weeks and other projects can take anywhere up to, you know, years. So it, the, um, it depends on the, the commitment of the kids. So I'm going to stop talking because I've been talking for an hour and a half, and I'm sorry that I've done all the talking. Um, did anybody have any last-minute questions? I'm not going to have time. Oh, this is a <coughs> – these are the commitments that the kids did <coughs> um, to help the Earth, and they, they gathered them from family and friends. Um, this is one of the video conferences. The person right in the corner – where just where above where it says add, that's the scientist from Borneo who came in and and um, she had the orangutans with her, which was really cool. She had them in her um, in the office. Okay, so sort of to end, looking at all these 2.0 tools, some of the tools, been, and this is a um, a wordle that my students did at the end of last year. I asked them to write down anything they could think of that they used to communicate with another class. And this is what they came up with. And um, IRON and Taking It Global came, um, it's bigger because more students put it in there in their words. They thought that those words were a little bit more important, so they showed up a little bit bigger. But maybe think about how you can use some of these tools to communicate and collaborate with another class. Think about how you can, um, some of the organizations that you might be able to link into that you can, um, that you can join. I'm, I'm going to show you a, a, a site that you can go to in a second that's going to give you all the links for Rock Our World and Taking It Global and ePals and iEarn and um, just, there's just so many things out there to connect. But what I really want you to think about is how these tools they're great on their own. It's amazing technology, but what, you know, what has Illuminate done for some of the students in these projects? It's allowed them to, to speak to somebody like Bat Chen's mother. Um, what has Google Earth done? It's, it's, it's enabled us to share what we've learned about a project with others. Um, what um, blogging does, it allows us to communicate in, you know, pretty much quick time. 
um, with our class, our partner class in Taiwan, so that we can share our news about our teddy bear. So these tools, these 2.0 tools, aren't just about the technology, it's about developing relationships. So <coughs> there's two um, resources that we want to share with you. One of them is um, if you seen a, a project here that you want to take back to your school and share with some of your staff members. If you go to uh, Jim's um, website, it's jcarlton.net and then it's backslash iron. Um, you can go, it's a, a power, online PowerPoint presentation, a Adobe Presenter presentation, and there's a tab on the side that says iron projects. And then you can click on any of the iron projects, plus a lot more. There's Machinto, um, there's Global Teenager in there, and there's a, like a mini presentation about all of those that you can share with the staff. If you go with, to the Learn with, the, with World Wiki Spaces, it's a wiki where we put all the links to the resources. We put some support videos there that you can take a look at and um, has information on how to connect with us. and information on how you can join IRON. So we hope we're going to offer this to your schools as well. We hope that your schools are interested in joining IRON. So um, sort of as the teacher who is <coughs> in the webinar, if you want to, um, to sign your school up, just email me and just um, tell your teachers to put that they were in the OTS webinar and, and we'll um, approve, their, approve their membership. The reason that we, we just think it's changed, it's changed us as, as people, these projects have changed the way that we teach, um, it's changed our students, and um, we would just love to see you getting involved too and catching some of the excitement that comes along with it. So um, I think that's it. So our, our contact information is here. So just send him an email and say, Hey, I learned a little bit about iron. Can you tell me more? <laughs> and um, yeah, thanks for coming out. Like, I know what a big commitment it is for teachers, especially during report card time, to be coming and, and learning about new technologies and, and new opportunities for your students. And, you know, connecting this way through pro professional development is just awesome. And, you know, we hope that we can connect again. Sorry, I was typing away there. Thank you so much, Mally. Uh, this